did on picking out your barn wood and buying barn wood and some tips on building with barn wood. Uh, it is a little different challenge when you're using lumber that's um, getting over 100 years old, which is what this barn wood is. And again, go ahead and watch my other video and that'll tell you a little bit more about the actual materials that I chose to use uh, to build this uh, entertainment center with. Um, a couple of things you're going to start to think about uh, <coughs> when you're purchasing your barn wood as well. Um, is obviously going to be the dimensions of the uh, piece that you're building. Um, again, like I said, this was barn wood, two barns, <coughs> a red barn and a white barn uh, that this l actual lumber came off of. Uh, and the red barn is about 102 years old. It came from about 1915 out uh, of North Dakota. And the white wood was probably closer to 1935. Uh, again, from North, uh, North, a beautiful North Dakota barn uh, that had been dismantled and I was able to collect. Uh, <clears throat> but because I knew I wanted to build a piece this big, um, I knew I was going to need about, you know, 50, 60, maybe 65 boards, uh, you know, 10 feet-ish in length um, to get something like this built. And uh, I also knew the specific colors that I was looking for. Um, I actually did not want the gray barn wood. I wanted something with some paint color. Um, and I really wanted white and I really wanted red. So it worked out perfectly uh, when I was able to get a hold of this kind of barn wood. Uh, but be again, because of the size of the piece that I, I was building, uh, because I knew it was going to go near a wood stove, it was going to be sitting near some heat, um, and because I knew what it was going to be used for, uh, determined a lot of how I was going to pick out those boards and what I was looking for. So uh, in this case, like I said, what I did was build a uh, entertainment center and I will have these dimensions for you uh, on my supply list on my website, Susie Home Center of the Rockies. Um, I don't have blueprints for what I build, but I do hopefully uh, show you how to do this uh, step by step. Uh, and then with tongue and groove or shiplap, whatever you want to call it, um, it's much easier to build uh, with this kind of a material in panels as opposed to trying to build this piece by piece. So we'll talk a little bit about how I assembled this in uh, panels, which is the easiest way to work with TNG uh, because it's just too hard to get everything to fit exactly uh, how you're planning it when you're doing it piece by piece. So it's a little different than working with other types of lumber. So if you've ever built with TNG or anything that has some kind of a groove system, a tongue and groove system, you'll know <coughs> a lot of the time it's just easier to build this in panels. So because this was an entertainment center and it had cabinets and it has shutters and it has doors, uh, you know, it is easy to build this piece by piece. Uh, and that's what we're going to go through uh, step by step here. Uh, and then, of course, anytime you're building anything, um, you're always taking a couple things into consideration. Uh, and obviously, number one is what it's going to actually be used for, what its purpose is, uh, where it's going to go, the actual location of where it's going to go. So, you know, in my case, I had just a real specific amount of space to um, build something like this. Uh, and then what you're going to put in it. So, of course, this one was built to hold about up to about a 70-inch uh, flat screen TV, which was the goal, uh, and also have lots of cabinet space underneath to hold uh, DVDs and movies, uh, music, you know, just about basically anything that had to do with entertainment. Uh, so lots of storage uh, involved on this, probably more than I'm actually ever going to need. Uh, and then, you know, even maybe just a place to um, display things, you know, or put books or uh, any other kind of smaller items, even more uh, DVDs or, you know, the old VHS movies uh, in another section. So I had real, a real specific design uh, set up for this because I knew exactly what I wanted to put in it, which just does help absolutely, especially when you're 
measuring shelves, um, you know, because like a DVD is under eight inches, and I think uh, the VHS is like ten and a half or something. So anyway, you know, that's also going to help you determine um, your design. You know, of course, how um, you know you want to set up your shelving. Uh, and then on the other side of this cabinet, I have all my music and uh, CDs. So lots of storage space uh, on this particular unit. And then um, also something else you absolutely have to consider when you're building uh, is the weight. You know, if you're building that big of a piece is the weight and, of course, how you're going to move it uh, and who's going to move it for you. So fortunately, I have lots of boys to help me with that even though they are getting really sick of helping me move stuff. Um, and someday they're probably going to try and escape on me and not help me at all. So uh, obviously this piece had to be built in two pieces. Uh, this is one of the bigger pieces I've built. Um, and it did turn out actually to be one of the heavier pieces that I built. Um, so I wound up having to do a little bit of research on what kind of lumber I thought this might be because um, despite the fact that I used some of the lightest... Uh, lightweight wood that I could for my framing, which was just some uh, cedar strip, uh, cedar that I stripped or ripped into one by two pieces uh, for my framing so that I could make this as light as possible. Uh, it still came out really heavy. So I'm still kind of convinced that it's a pine um, based on the region that it came from, which I talk about in my first video uh, about picking out your barn wood. Um, and it did come from North Dakota, but there's a good chance that it, uh, it didn't actually come from the forest in North Dakota. It might have come in by train from a nearby state or Canada. Uh, so I'm still thinking it's pine, uh, possibly cottonwood. Uh, it just came out really heavy. Uh, so this was a little bit of a challenge, even in the two pieces that I built it. And obviously this was the first piece that I built, and the top half was the second piece that I built. A um, little tricky to move, barely you know, made it through a 36-inch standard door. Um, so, of course, you also have to consider what, what entryways or what doorways it's, it's going in and possibly coming out of at some other point in time. Um, <clears throat> so that is, uh, again, going to help you determine your dimensions um, and how you're going to build it. So this was two pieces. Uh, and then, you know, anytime you are building things, um, you also have to consider how you're going to paint and sand those things. Um, so there's a lot of pieces that you're going to build separately and then attach after the piece is moved. So obviously shutters is a good example of that. Um, you know, it would be easy to sand and paint this with it still attached, but they still have to come off to move it um, just to make it easier to move. So pieces like shutters and pieces like the shelving um, that are on the inside, you generally want to make removable so that it's not as hard to sand and paint them um, when it's all built. And then try and, try and do those separately, and then maybe before you move it or after you move it, um, actually set those pieces in. And that helps a lot with the weight. So, and then, you know, shutters are kind of tricky to build anyway, because even if you build this on a perfectly level uh, uh, surface, chances are the level, or the surface that you're, the flooring that you're putting it on when you move it may not be as level as it was wherever you built that, um, and your shutters are going to have to be adjusted anyway. So I did have to do some adjusting on the shutters, which generally happens with shutters anyway, um, <clears throat> after it got put in the spot that I got put in. So a little bit of adjusting on that. Um, but bottom line was, this is an outdoor project, like I talked about in my first video, uh, probably lead paint as well on this particular barnwood. Lots of dirt, lots of dust, uh, lots of toxins. So it was 100% an outdoor project. Um, I talked about washing it in my first video. Uh, obviously, couldn't use a pressure washer because it would have stripped off too much paint. So it was a real soft spray on a hose that I used um, to clean this and, again, could not believe how much dirt uh, came off of a barn that's over 100 years old. Uh, I always wind up using my star bit screws. Uh, a lot of people don't like that look. Uh, they don't want to see, you know, especially finished carpenters don't like to see wherever you've fastened something, um, but I have used staples and I have used uh, finish screws and they just don't grab that well when it comes to lumber that, that, that's this old and this hard. So because you might have some warping or some other issues going on with, with lumber this old, um, I do suggest using something that really grabs tight 
um, and doesn't allow anything to move, especially with this TNG, because this stuff has a tendency, especially on the shutters, uh, to slide up and down. So you really need some good heavy-duty fasteners. Um, and then, of course, you're also going to determine how you're going to finish this project, um, whether it's going to be unfinished or finished. Now, because my particular entertainment center is sitting next to a wood stove, um, and I have some issues with heat, uh, I chose to finish it with a, almost a matte to a satin uh, polyurethane, a real heavy-duty polyurethane. Um, and I don't usually do that because I don't like that sheen at all. Uh, but one thing it does do is bring out the green and the paint and a lot of the uh, flaws that we like. So uh, I did wind up polyurethane this entire cabinet from head to toe, front to back, every corner. Um, it took almost two weeks for that smell to go away before I could even bring it in. Um, so, you know, I will have, like I said, a supply list for you on my website. Uh, so, you know, you need your lumber that you've picked out. And again, go back to my other video on picking out barn wood uh, for more information on that. And your fasteners, and then, of course, whatever kind of hardware you decide to use. Uh, now, again, I talked about this before, but you uh, can also get a uh, rust kit for hardware, which is a little bit more time-consuming, and I have used it. Uh, and it does come out really pretty. Uh, but I didn't have that much time on this project, so I just used a bronze spray paint on my hardware. Just picked out some old simple hardware and spray painted it. Uh, but again, you could go back to that rust kit and have some rusty hardware on there too, which comes out nice. Uh, so then again, of course, you're going to need your hardware and your hinges, uh, you know, and whatever other kind of little pieces you decide to do. Uh, this hole was actually in one of my boards, so I didn't even have to make that hole. Uh, to bring in my my uh, cords for my TV. So sometimes you get lucky and you don't even have to do stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> but when you think about trying to do a piece like this justice, um, these boards that came off a barn uh, were probably hand, well, the posts and the beams were from that barn were probably hand-hewn, and the boards were hand-cut with a saw. So one thing I noticed about this batch that I picked out, uh, <clears throat> these boards a lot of them were probably cut straighter with a handsaw uh, than I could have even done with my miter saw. Um, so really a lot of skill involved when they did these barns without power tools and without pressure washers. Um, so I personally tried to leave as many what I call flaws or character uh, in my wood as I could. So <clears throat> when you get to the point where you've gathered all your materials, your next step is going to be sorting your materials, which, you know, if you've built with uh, old lumber or lumber that has a lot of variations in it, um, you'll know that, that you're going to actually spend quite a bit of time sorting your lumber before you even start touching it or cutting it. Um, so one thing you're going to do, obviously, with all projects is sort your boards by lengths so that you know how much materials you have and make sure that you have enough materials to build what you're planning on building. So beyond just sorting your boards by lengths, um, I also chose to sort my boards by character. So what, I, what that means is that some of these pieces, um, as you can see, like obviously this is going to be the back of my shutters because we're not really going to see the back of the boards. Um, and I also chose, chose boards that were a little more rotten um, and almost rotten to the point where I couldn't use them, but I had no choice because I was kind of limited on my materials. Uh, so when you get to boards that are peeling or chipping and you're going to sand that or you're going to use a paint scraper or something just to get those sharp pieces off. Um, you know, don't get too carried away with it or you're going to wind up with big um, gouges in it like that and chips, um, which were a little unavoidable and I really didn't like it. But uh, they're on the inside and for the most part you're not going to see those. So your first step is to find the oldest boards and possibly even some warped boards if you can use them and try and hide those. So those are going to be either like on the inside of a shutter or in my case on the on the back wall where nobody's going to see anything um, or maybe on the inside of this cabinet where you're not going to see that as much either. Um, and then some of those boards that were in a little better condition even though they didn't have the paint on them I still chose to use uh, on a surface so that you could see it visually because some of that actually matched my flooring that I had in that room. So again, it goes back to trying to decide where this piece is going to go. Um, so even though I was more concerned about the whites and the reds, I did have some of the brown that I left um, to be visual because it matched my floor. Um, so you've still got to think about where that piece is going to go. 
And then <clears throat> another thing I noticed too when I was sort of sorting these boards, obviously I picked the best boards in my case, meaning the whitest boards or the ones that were not so gray because I didn't want the gray, um, and used those for the sections that you're going to focus on the most. So even though there'll be a big TV here blocking all that, um, you know, for now, this is very apparent and these front cabinets are very apparent. So <clears throat> when I started building this bottom piece first, I picked out the best boards in terms of paint uh, that we're actually going to be looking at the most. Okay, and then those I used for the cabinet doors. So, and then I'll show you the side here in a second where <clears throat> you're also going to see the side boards uh, more than you're even going to see these because this will be covered by a TV. So <clears throat> when you have paint or flaws or nail holes or things like this, um, <clears throat> you'll actually spend quite a bit of time, like I said, picking out where those boards are going to go and sorting them, unlike other projects where you're not so concerned about that stuff. So I even did things where I, like, I tried to alternate the nail holes, you know, so there wasn't a whole row of nail holes on the top here. You know, some of them were on the top, some of them were on the bottom, some of them were on the top. Um, you know, and then in some places I just didn't have a choice because, you know, I was running out of lumber. Um, <clears throat> but I did chose to use pieces that particularly had flaws in them, um, you know, like the rust from a nail um, or even some dirt that I chose not to sand off of some of the paint um, because when these barns were repainted, uh, the dirt just kept getting painted over and over and stayed in the paint. Um, so if you choose to sand some of that paint, you're going to get something like this. If you're trying to get rid of, I mean, uh, get rid of some of that dirt, you're going to get down to the bare lumber, or uh, you're going to leave some of that dirt on there, um, which I did because it's just more character. So again, you know, trying to decide what pieces are going to be seen the most. Um, you can also tell that this color red here is different than this red. And that's probably because this might have been on the north side of the barn where it didn't have as much sun exposure. Um, and I just kind of at least made this top frame uh, a little bit more uniform and then used the older pieces for the shutters. So things like that happen too where you get lots of different variations in paint color uh, even out of the same batch. <coughs> so you just have to decide how you want that to look um, and where it's going to go. So you will spend a lot more time preparing and sorting um, and kind of picking at your best boards before you even start cutting, like on a lot of other projects where you're not even paying attention to that. Uh, so, and then on the back side of my uh, piece, which I'll have a picture for you here in a second, um, there's a, a place where I always like to include uh, the year that I built it, and I sign it, and I talk a little bit about the piece itself, because to me, <coughs> building with these great pieces and trying to do it justice um, has a lot to do with the history behind it. So I always put a little something on the back that talks about where this lumber came from, um, and then I sign my pieces and I date it. Um, I also like to use um, some of the boards where you can't really see too well in this video, um, where the <coughs> farmers had actually put their uh, ratios or their formulas, um, possibly for their oil or their tractors or the equipment, um, they had actually wrote that on some of the boards that they left in the barn, on the white board. So I do have a few pieces um, on the back and the front that you can't see so well uh, that came from whoever wrote down those ratios. And I just think that's awesome because it's a little bit more history to the piece. Okay, so we talked about really just sorting your boards and getting your boards ready uh, to start cutting and building with. Um, so now let's just talk about actually assembling your piece. Um, <clears throat> so of course we're starting with, with two pieces here, the bottom and the top, like we talked about, two separate pieces. Um, and with tongue and groove, particularly older tongue and groove, where your uh, dimensions on your boards are going to be a little more off, um, you know, like a standard piece of TNG is usually about uh, five and a half inches, you know, from the tongue to the groove. Um, but then when they're put together, it gets closer to about five inches when they're all pieced together. Um, <clears throat> the problem with this older wood is that you can see, you know, like this piece right here is even missing part of the groove. Um, and then, you know, some of the tongue part of this is peeling, you know. So your, your dimensions are just not going to be exact um, like they would be on a new board. So what winds up happening is that when you're building this by panels, which is what I suggest you do, um, <clears throat> 
that way you end up with an end result of what that dimension is going to be. So <clears throat> basically what that means is I, I started on the very, very back side, the back wall of your bottom piece, which is basically how, how you start with most things, um, as opposed to your base first. Um, and that is because by the time you get all these boards put together, even if you think you got your measurements exact uh, to when all those boards are, are put together in a panel, it's not. Um, so because usually start with the base of your project first. That's not going to work in this case because these boards are old and the dimensions are just not going to be exact. So <clears throat> you start on your very back wall and of this bottom piece, the very back, and see what that dimension comes out to be. Um, because chances are it's going to be off by an eighth of an inch or, an, or a quarter of an inch, which as you know, if you've built anything before, can screw up your whole project. Um, so start with your very back wall piece and see what that all turns out to be when it's all put together. Um, and then you can build your bottom, your base, um, to fit that back wall. Um, that's my suggestion. If you do it the other way around, uh, it gets a little more complicated. So, <clears throat> and then the other thing you have to consider too when you're uh, doing a piece like this is whether it's going to have feet on it or not. Um, I always put feet on my stuff, on my projects. Um, but I also like to put a front uh, base on it. So that basically it just means that you're never going to get dirt or anything going underneath your cabinet. I mean, you're still going to get something under there. But I do build feet first, which is usually just a couple of 2x4s as opposed to an actual foot. Um, and then I cover the, oh, I, I make it, build this whole thing so that I can put a front cover on it, and that way you're never having to get underneath it. Um, so, <clears throat> again, you're building your, your back wall and then your base. Um, to match that back wall, depending on how that all fits together. And then, <clears throat> as you're getting to those two, uh, finished with those two panels, then you're going to start building your side panels. Um, now, I'll get back to why this is a little different dimension than this one when we, when we get to the top. Uh, but, you know, you're going to do your two side panels on both sides of your base. And then, you also, something I like to do is put corners uh, on most of my pieces too, just especially if it, it's, it's heavy and it has to be moved, it just kind of keeps everything a little bit more secure. So I always put uh, a set of corners um, on the backs and sometimes the front, depending on what I'm building, um, of those side panels, just to keep things a little bit more secure. Uh, and then last but not least, after you've got your back wall, your base, and your side panels, you're going to do your top uh, surface there. Um, <coughs> And then after you've got that all done, which hopefully you're watching my step-by-step -step pictures here as we're talking, uh, your last piece on the bottom is going to be your front cabinets. Now again, that's kind of like shutters. You may have to adjust these again once you get them onto the original floor um, that it's going to be sitting on because the flooring in here um, is definitely, you can see this is scraping the floor a little bit because the floor is not level here uh, like it was outside. Um, another thing I'd suggest <coughs> also is that you use one more hinge than this. I only did two hinges. I should have done a third one. I didn't realize how heavy this door was going to come out as well. So it did drop a little bit um, on the very end here. You could, there's a little bit of a gap there. And really, if I had had a third hinge on there, I think it would have um, held that up a little higher because the doors are a little bit big. Um, so maybe three hinges instead of two um, and any kind of decorative you know, trim you want to do on the front there. Um, there is a reason why people build with a diagonal like this, and that's just to keep all these uh, boards from shifting up and down. Uh, <coughs> I also chose not to use standard uh, latches on this because these are the kind of latches that they had in the old days uh, before they even had hardware. Um, just a little strip of wood there, or you can do your own kind of hardware latch. Um, anyway, and again, just very simple hardware. Uh, and then that was basically how I built the bottom piece. Now, on the second piece here, I did choose to make this a little bit more narrow uh, in depth than I did the bottom piece because I just thought it was going to be too top heavy and just too bulky if they were both the same dimension. So my choice was to make this um, almost half of what this bottom piece is uh, in depth. And again, doing corners. Um, and then when you do start adding things like shutters or any extra pieces, um, you will have to wind up doing some caps on the ends. So I did wind up capping out <coughs> everything where something was going to be uh, sitting underneath that or on top of that. 
So on your top piece, again, you're starting with your very, very back uh, panel, and then adding your sides, adding both sides, and then last but not least, adding your top uh, plate on the very top. Um, and then I chose to, as I said, again, do shutters and this little extra uh, chicken coop looking shelf, um, really just for decorative purposes. So you're going to build this frame entirely separate. Um, but I chose to use hardware cloth, which I use a lot of instead of chicken wire, because uh, it was a little bit smaller scale wire uh, than the chicken wire. And I think I did spray paint that, uh, that bronze spray paint as well before I put it on. So built this piece separately, uh, you know, to fit inside that about 12 inch uh, shelf up there, and then used some hinges to uh, put that on. Uh, let's see, so does that go? Yeah, that goes like that. So, and again, just another strip of wood for a latch. Um, and then, uh, like I said, last but not least, my shutters. And you will, uh, like I said, be adjusting those quite a bit. When I went back and, like I said, polyurethaned the heck out of everything. Uh, this project, I would say, wasn't so much the building aspect of this that was time consuming. Uh, but again, picking out my picking out and sorting my boards to a very specific design, and then uh, a lot of washing and a lot of sanding uh, on this wood because I did not want my entire house to smell like a 102 year old barn. <laughs> um, another thing I suggest is that when you buy uh, either buy or make your one by twos for your framing. Um, again, just go as small as you can so it does, doesn't get too heavy, uh, but I do like to use cedar. Uh, I, like, I like to rip cedar into 1x2s as opposed to pine because it's a little softer um, and you don't get as many splits and you don't have to do as much pre-drilling. And then some of this TNG, depending on how hardened this wood is, some of it does get really, really hard. Uh, some of it you will have to pre-drill some of your holes um, just so it doesn't split, particularly on the ends. Like, Try and build as many pieces separately as you can. So make the shelving uh, separately, and then possibly even wash it, sand it, and stain it before you put it back in. Um, or at least wash and sand it before you get it back in there. Uh, just because sometimes when you get into smaller areas like this, it just gets really hard to paint. Um, or polyurethane. So as many of these pieces as you can, like shelving and shutters, and cabinets up on the top there. Um, if you can work on those separately and attach them last or put them in last, um, that's kind of the way to go. It just makes everything a lot easier when it comes to finishing your project. Some of these just came out really gray. Um, I did have to go back and actually add a little bit of like a semi-transparent uh, white stain because they were. I just didn't want that gray. I just had way too many color variations going on and it was starting to look too busy. Um, so I don't know if I mentioned, uh, pressure washing is probably not a good idea uh, when it comes to paint this old at all because it's going to strip your paint. So unless you don't want that paint on there, go ahead and pressure wash it. But even the sprayer on a hose will take off too much paint. Um, and it started doing that on some of these older boards like the grayer boards. It just flat out took the paint right off. Um, and so it was a little tricky to wash this without taking off some of this paint because I really wanted it all on there. But the ones that it did come off of, um, I did, as I said, go back and do a really light, uh, semi-transparent white. Uh, and some of these boards, as I talked about up here where there was just dirt, um, even after some of these white boards, and I'm sure this kind of probably only applies to the color white, uh, but some of these white boards, even after they were washed and even after I sanded them down a little bit, uh, still looked really dirty. So, and it probably was because there was actual dirt, uh, you know, stuck to the paint and stuck to the wood. So it really depends on the look you're going for. Um, but I did want a little bit more of a uniform white finish on all of this. Um, and even though it had that character and it had that flaw, it still just looked dirty. So you have to decide if you want the white dirty look or if you want the white clean look. <laughs> So obviously, I do like the character and I do like the flaws, but it just looked, still looked a little too dirty to me. And because of the size of this piece, it was just getting overwhelming and there was just way too much variation and everything. So again, I did go back and just do a little bit of touch-ups here and there on some of the pieces that I just thought looked dirty. Um, and then even maybe sanded over that again too. 
So just lots of finish work on this, uh, and then did go back and polyurethane. And the polyurethane uh, does bring out the green, you know, and then again, just try not to use something with a high gloss, or you're going to lose that uh, aged look. Um, <clears throat> another thing about the polyurethane is there's a couple different versions of polyurethane. There's a polycrylic, and there's a polyurethane. The polycrylic is more expensive, it's water-based, it's easier to work with, uh, but it does have a little bit of a blue cast to it, um, kind of like a milky blue cast to it. And I noticed even though it is 100% easier to work with, it's not as sticky, it's just 100 times easier, um, you do get a little bit of a different shade. So if you're like me and you're real specific about your finished product, um, pick your polyurethane or your sealer very carefully and actually look on the can and, and tell you if it has a little bit of a tint to it. Um, I actually used one of the cheapest polyurethane cans you can buy, uh, but it was thicker. Uh, it was not waterproof. It was also, uh, I mean, water-based. Uh, it was probably an oil-based. And it also had a little bit of a yellow cast to it, uh, but that's what I wanted. So what that did is gave it uh, a much heavier, thicker coverage, thicker coverage, but it also brought out some of the yellows uh, and a little bit of the amber colors in the wood, which is what I wanted, and it, and it brought this white down one more level, too. So be, be a little picky about your sealers. Pay a little bit more of attention about the, the color of it itself. Even though it's all going to say it's clear, it's not. Um, and it is a lot messier, and it's a lot stickier, and it's a lot harder to work with. Uh, but I was much happier with the final product. So lots of things, again, to think about. Uh, watch my first video on picking out your actual barn wood and tips for building with it. And then you have this video here, which hopefully gives you an idea of how to start uh, building maybe something like this for your project. Uh, and again, I'll have a supply list for you on my website, Susie Homesteader of the Rockies. And if you have any other questions, uh, let me know. So we'll see you there. Bye-bye. So, let's get started. Subscribe to the Susie Homesteader channel, and we'll see you there. Bye-bye.